What if I told you that the legend of humans transforming into wolves stretches back thousands of years? Before the werewolves you know from movies or books, these creatures were already prowling the corners of ancient myth and medieval superstition. They weren't just characters in stories. For many, they were real, living in the shadows, feared under the light of the full moon. Throughout history, werewolves have been part of our imagination. From the grand temples of ancient Greece to the small, isolated villages of medieval Europe, tales of humans turning into wolves spread far and wide. These stories weren't just entertainment, they reflected deep fears and beliefs about the natural world, the wilderness, and even the human mind. Today, we're going to trace the origins of the werewolf myth. We'll explore ancient legends, look at real historical events, and uncover why people feared these creatures. From kings punished by gods, to villagers accused of dark transformations, we'll see how this legend has survived for thousands of years. But before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank SNHU student for their continued support as a senator member. Your support keeps this journey through history alive. Come join the community and unlock exclusive content. You can be a citizen member, senator, or consul member. And for those of you wanting to take a piece of this adventure with you, check out the History Chibi merch. Gear up for the selection season. There's something for everyone. Now, sit back and get ready to explore the chilling, fascinating, and ancient history of werewolves. Let's start our journey in ancient Greece where one of the first werewolf stories was told. The myth is about King Lycaon, who ruled over Arcadia. According to the story, King Lycaon tried to trick the god Zeus by serving him a meal that wasn't what it seemed. But Zeus knew what was going on and, as punishment, turned the king into a wolf. From then on, Lycaon was forced to live as a wolf, separated from other people. This myth is an ancient warning about the dangers of trying to deceive the gods. This story of Lycan wasn't just a simple punishment, it carried a deeper meaning. In Greek culture, wolves symbolized the wild, the untamed parts of nature, and even the human soul. The transformation of a man into a wolf represented a loss of control, a descent into savagery. To the ancient Greeks, shape-shifting wasn't just a fantasy, it was a symbol of divine punishment, a reminder that those who defied the gods could lose their very humanity. As we move from Greece to Rome, the figure of the wolf becomes even more powerful. The Romans inherited many of their myths from earlier cultures, but they added their own interpretations. One of the most famous writers of the Roman world, Pliny the Elder described men who could transform into wolves. According to him, in certain regions, it was believed that once a year, a man could cross into the realm of beasts. He would shed his human skin and live as a wolf for nine years before returning to his human form. But Roman beliefs went beyond mere myth. Wolves were deeply rooted in their culture. The festival of Lupercalia is a prime example. Celebrated every February, this ancient ritual honored the god of fertility and the she-wolf who nursed Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. During Lupercalia, priests dressed in animal skins and ran through the streets, symbolically driving away evil spirits. The wolf, far from being just a predator, was a symbol of protection and rebirth. It connected the Romans to their mythic origins. The connection between wolves and humans ran deep in Roman culture. The Romans didn't see wolves as mere animals. 
they believe these creatures could represent the wild power lurking within all of us. In Roman mythology, wolves were a link between the human and the divine, a reflection of our ability to shift between civilization and savagery. As we step back and look at these early myths, one thing becomes clear. The idea of humans becoming wolves wasn't just a story. It was a powerful symbol representing transformation, punishment, and a connection to the natural world. From Greece to Rome, the werewolf legend began to take shape, rooted in ancient beliefs about the boundaries between man and beast. Our journey now takes us to the frozen lands of the north, where the line between man and beast was thinner than anywhere else. In Norse mythology, the wolf was not just an animal to be feared, but a symbol of raw power. This power was harnessed by the fiercest warriors of the Viking Age, the Ulfhednar and Berserkers. These were no ordinary soldiers. They fought with the strength and ferocity of wild beasts wearing the skins of wolves into battle. The Ulfhednar, in particular, were known to wear wolf pelts, believing that this granted them the strength and spirit of the wolf itself. In battle, they were unstoppable. They fought without armor, driven by an almost supernatural fury. To their enemies, they were terrifying, seeming more beast than man. This transformation, though symbolic, blurred the lines between warrior and wolf. In their minds, they were becoming wolves, tapping into an ancient force that connected them with the wild. But the wolf was not just an ally to the Norse, it was also a source of fear. In their myths, the giant wolf Fenrir looms large. This monstrous wolf was prophesied to devour the gods themselves during Ragnarok, the end of the world. Bound by the gods in an attempt to control him, Fenrir symbolized chaos and destruction. Yet, he was also a part of the natural order. For the Norse, the wolf was both protector and destroyer, a creature tied to their deepest fears and their highest aspirations. Moving from the Norse to the Germanic tribes, we find a similar connection between men and wolves. Early Germanic legends are full of stories about warriors who could transform into wolves. These transformations were often tied to battle, much like the Ulfhednar. But there was another layer to these tales. In Germanic mythology, the transformation could also be a curse. The werewolf, as it was known, was a being caught between two worlds. In some stories, a man could become a werewolf through dark magic, or as a punishment for a grave crime. Once transformed, he would roam the forests, cut off from human society, living as a beast. But unlike other werewolves, the werewolf was not always a villain. In some regions, it was believed that these creatures could act as protectors, guarding their villages from other dangers. In this way, the werewolf in Germanic legend was a figure of duality, both savior and monster. These beliefs reflected a deep connection to the natural world. For the Germanic tribes, the forests were full of dangers. Wolves were real threats, but they were also symbols of survival and strength. To become a wolf, even through a curse, was to take on that power to walk a path between human and animal. This idea of transformation wasn't just a punishment, it was a connection to something primal. In both Norse and Germanic traditions, we see a complex relationship with the wolf. These myths weren't just stories. They reflected the fears, hopes, and beliefs of the people who lived alongside wolves in the wild whether through warriors who channeled the strength of the wolf or cursed men who wandered the woods, the legend of the werewolf continued to evolve, 
rooted in a respect and fear of the wild. As we move into medieval Europe, the fear of werewolves took on a new and darker form. In France, the legend of the Lou Garou began to emerge. These werewolves weren't just part of folklore, they reflected a growing fear of the wilderness and the creatures that lived within it. For people living in the isolated villages of medieval France, the woods were dangerous. Wolves were a very real threat, attacking livestock and, sometimes, people. It's no surprise then that the idea of a human turning into a wolf became a powerful story, one that reflected the anxieties of the time. The Loup Garou was believed to be a cursed figure. In some versions of the story, a person became a werewolf through witchcraft, or as punishment for a sin. In others, the curse could be passed on, like a sickness. Once transformed, the Lou Garou would roam the forests, terrorizing villages and killing livestock under the light of the full moon. But unlike ordinary wolves, this creature was cunning. It had the mind of a man, but the body of a beast. Specific regions in rural France were especially plagued by these legends. In the countryside, where wolves were still a constant presence, the fear of the Lou Garou ran deep. Local stories warned of strange figures lurking at the edge of the forest, watching, waiting for their chance to strike. These tales spread from village to village, building a collective fear of the unknown, of the dangers that lay just beyond the safety of the village walls. In Germany, fear of werewolves grew stronger during a time when concerns about witchcraft were spreading across Europe. Many people started to believe that witches and werewolves were connected, thinking that witches could call upon wolves or even change into them. Within this superstitious fear, anyone accused of being a witch could also be accused of being a werewolf. In Scandinavia, the idea of men transforming into wolves also persisted during the medieval period. These beliefs were rooted in the Viking Age traditions, where warriors were thought to be able to call upon the spirit of the wolf for strength. Even after the Viking Age had passed, stories continued of men who could transform using special charms or spells. These men weren't always seen as evil, though. In some regions, they were thought to be protectors, using their abilities to guard their homes from real wolves or other dangers. But in other areas, they were feared, seen as outcasts who had delved too deeply into the dark arts. Throughout medieval Europe, the fear of werewolves reflected a broader fear of the wild and the unknown. In a time when the forests were dark, dangerous, and full of real threats, the idea that a man could become a wolf was more than just a myth. It was a terrifying possibility. Whether as a cursed figure, a servant of the devil, or a protector, the werewolf became a symbol of the fragile line between civilization and the wilderness. By the 16th and 17th centuries, Europe was gripped by hysteria. It was a time of fear and suspicion. The witch hunts were in full force, and alongside the accusations of witchcraft came another growing terror, the werewolf. These werewolf trials ran parallel to the witch hunts, feeding off the same fears of the unknown, the unnatural, and the dangerous wilderness that seemed to encroach on everyday life. In places like France, Germany, and Switzerland, the line between witches and werewolves blurred. People believed that witches could summon wolves or even transform into them. The werewolf became a symbol of the wild man, a figure who had crossed the boundaries of civilization, aligning himself with the forces of darkness. The forests that surrounded villages were not just places of mystery, 
They were dangerous, filled with wolves that posed a real threat to livestock and people. But in these times of panic, the fear wasn't just of wolves, it was of men who could become wolves, men who could stalk the night, attacking without mercy. One of the well-known cases from this time is the trial of Gilles Garnier in France in 1573. Garnier, a man who lived alone in the woods, was accused of being a werewolf. Over several months, children had gone missing, and the villagers were very scared. When Garnier was caught, he confessed, after being questioned harshly, that he was a werewolf. He claimed that a special ointment had been given to him, allowing him to transform into a wolf. Garnier was punished, but his case was just one of many during a time when fear and suspicion were high. People who lived alone or near forests were often accused of strange things. Germany, too, saw its share of werewolf trials. The werewolf of Bedburg, Peter Stump, was one of the most notorious cases in Europe. Stump was accused of being a werewolf and a cannibal, just like Garnier. He, too, confessed under torture, claiming that he had made a pact with the devil and used a magical belt to turn into a wolf. The details of his trial were grisly, with accusations of him attacking and killing his neighbors. Stump's execution was brutal, reflecting the intense fear and hatred that surrounded these accusations. The idea that someone could willingly transform into a wolf, embracing the wild and savage, terrified people who were already grappling with the chaos of witchcraft trials. In Switzerland, another layer of terror was added to the werewolf myth. There, people believed that witches could summon wolves as their familiars, or even transform themselves into wolves to carry out evil deeds. The mountains and forests of Switzerland were seen as wild, untamed places where dark forces might dwell. Villagers were quick to accuse those who lived on the outskirts, and many faced execution simply for being different. Perhaps one of the strangest werewolf trials occurred in Livonia in 1692. The trial of the Livonian werewolf offers a different perspective on the werewolf myth. In this case, an old man named Thies claimed not only to be a werewolf, but a werewolf who served God. According to his testimony, he was one of a group of werewolves who traveled to hell to battle witches and demons. Thias believed that he and his fellow werewolves were protecting the world from evil. Despite his claims that he was on the side of good, the court didn't see it that way. Thies was put on trial, and his beliefs were seen as dangerous and heretical. He was punished, but his case stands out as one of the few examples where a werewolf was seen as a protector rather than a threat. The werewolf trials, much like the witch hunts, were part of a broader social panic. During this time, Europe was grappling with religious conflict, social upheaval, and fear of the unknown. The wilderness, the forest, and the wolves that roamed it represented everything that was wild, untamable, and dangerous. The werewolf became a symbol of this fear. To the people of the time, these creatures weren't just myths, they were real threats, lurking just beyond the edge of civilization. These trials were brutal, with many innocent people caught up in the hysteria. But they also reveal how deeply rooted the fear of the werewolf was in the medieval mind. The idea that a man could become a beast, abandoning his humanity and embracing the wild, struck fear into the hearts of those living in a time when danger seemed to lurk around every corner. As we continue our journey, we enter Eastern Europe. 
a region rich with myths about the supernatural. In these lands, the werewolf, known as the Volkodlak, was more than just a creature of the night. It was deeply connected to beliefs about death and the undead. In Slavic mythology, the Volkodlak could transform from human to wolf, often as a result of a curse or a punishment. But unlike some Western legends, the Volkodlak wasn't always a living person. It was sometimes believed to be a spirit of the dead, cursed to roam the earth as a wolf. This association with death made the werewolf a terrifying figure in Slavic culture. The fear didn't end with death. In some regions, werewolves were closely linked to vampires. It was believed that when a Volkodlak died, it might rise again, not as a wolf, but as a vampire. The connection between these two creatures of the night blurred the lines between the living and the dead. Both were seen as unnatural forces, creatures that refused to stay in their graves. The Slavic people took these legends seriously, and many rituals were developed to protect against both werewolves and vampires. Moving south into the Balkans, we find another layer to the werewolf myth. In this region, werewolf legends were often tied to bloodlines. It wasn't just about being cursed or bitten. In the Balkans, the ability to transform into a wolf could be passed down through generations. Families believed that they carried the curse of the werewolf, and this curse would continue unless it was somehow broken. This belief in hereditary werewolves made the legend even more personal and terrifying. In these Balkan legends, the transformation wasn't always voluntary. A man could be cursed from birth, destined to become a werewolf without any choice in the matter. To protect themselves from this fate, the people of the Balkans developed specific rituals. One of the most common was the practice of burying suspected werewolves with iron stakes or silver coins. These items were thought to prevent the transformation after death, ensuring that the person wouldn't return to haunt the village as a wolf. These rituals reveal just how deeply rooted the fear of werewolves was in this region, where the line between man and beast seemed fragile. Further north, in Scandinavia, we find another fascinating twist on the werewolf legend. In this part of the world, wolves were both feared and respected. They were seen as powerful animals, symbols of strength, but also creatures of the wild, untamable, and dangerous. In Scandinavian folklore, men who were cursed to become wolves were often seen as outcasts, individuals who had fallen foul of magic or dark forces. The Scandinavian werewolf wasn't always a willing participant in his transformation. In some stories, men were cursed to live as wolves for a certain period, wandering the forests until the curse was lifted. In other tales, men who had committed terrible crimes were condemned to live as wolves forever, unable to return to human form. This belief in cursed men reflected the broader Scandinavian fear of the wild and the unknown. The forests were vast, dark, and filled with dangers, and the idea that a man could be lost to the wild, becoming part of it, was a powerful symbol. In Scandinavian culture, wolves themselves held a complex role. They were respected for their strength and intelligence, but they were also feared for their unpredictability. In some stories, the wolf was a creature of magic, capable of shape-shifting and moving between worlds. This respect for the wolf as a powerful animal blended with the fear of its wild nature, creating a rich tapestry of folklore where the line between man and wolf could be crossed with the right curse or the wrong decision. Across Eastern Europe, the Balkans and Scandinavia the werewolf legend took on different forms, but at its heart was a common theme. The fear of transformation, the fear of losing control, and the fear of the wild. Whether as a cursed spirit, 
a hereditary curse, or a punishment for crimes, the werewolf became a symbol of the untamed forces that lurk within us all. As the legend of the werewolf spread across Europe, some people began to wonder, could there be a more rational explanation? In the Middle Ages, belief in magic and curses was strong, but there were also those who tried to understand the world in different ways. This led to the first attempts at explaining lycanthropy, the belief that a person could transform into a wolf, not as a curse or magic, but as a medical condition. There are historical accounts of people who genuinely believed they could turn into wolves. Some even behaved like wolves, running on all fours, howling, and attacking livestock. These individuals were often seen as mad, and in some cases, their behavior led to their execution. But not everyone saw them as cursed by dark forces. Some doctors and scholars in the Middle Ages believed that these individuals were suffering from a mental illness. This condition, known as clinical lycanthropy, is a rare psychiatric disorder. Those afflicted with it believe they can turn into an animal, often a wolf. While we now understand that this is a mental health issue, during the Middle Ages, such behavior was often mistaken for evidence of supernatural shape-shifting. People feared these individuals, believing that they were genuinely capable of transforming into wild beasts. In many cases, these individuals were treated as if they were werewolves, persecuted and sometimes executed as a result. The connection between mental illness and lycanthropy wasn't the only explanation explored by early scholars. Some believed that certain diseases might be responsible for the werewolf legends. One of the most compelling theories is the idea that rabies, a disease spread through the bites of infected animals, could have influenced the myth. Rabies, which causes aggressive behavior, drooling, and a fear of water, might have led people to associate those infected with wolves. Rabid animals often acted in ways that were erratic and violent, and when humans contracted the disease, they too exhibited strange and frightening symptoms. The fact that rabies could be transmitted through bites only added to the fear, as the bite of a werewolf was thought to be the way the curse was passed on. It's easy to see how rabies, with its violent symptoms and animal-like behavior, could have been mistaken for a curse that transformed men into wolves. Another theory links the legend of werewolves to the condition known as porphyria, a rare blood disorder. Porphyria affects the skin and causes extreme sensitivity to sunlight, disfiguring the skin and teeth in some cases. Individuals with this disorder might have been seen as creatures of the night, hiding from the sun and appearing pale and strange. In some severe cases, their appearance might have been unsettling enough to fuel legends of people who were less than human. The physical symptoms of porphyria could have been mistaken for signs of a transformation, leading to fears that these individuals were werewolves in disguise. While today we can look at these conditions with a scientific eye, the people of the past didn't have the same understanding. To them, the strange behavior caused by mental illness, rabies, or porphyria seemed like evidence of something supernatural. And in a world where wolves roamed the forests and the unknown was a constant threat, the idea that a person could become a wolf was all too real. These medical and supernatural explanations show just how complex the werewolf legend is. It's a blend of fear, misunderstanding, and the human need to explain the unexplainable. Whether through mental illness, disease, or superstition, the fear of losing control and becoming something wild and dangerous 
was a powerful force in shaping the myth of the werewolf. By the 18th century, the fear of werewolves that once gripped Europe began to fade. The Enlightenment was sweeping across the continent, bringing with it new ways of thinking. People were beginning to question the old beliefs, and the werewolf trials that had once terrorized villages slowly came to an end. As science and reason took center stage, the idea of a person transforming into a wolf began to seem less plausible. Enlightenment thinkers focused on rational explanations for the world around them. Superstitions that had fueled the werewolf trials were now being challenged by new discoveries in medicine, psychology, and biology. What had once been seen as evidence of dark magic or a curse was now being reinterpreted. Strange behavior that might have led to accusations of lycanthropy was instead examined through the lens of science. The shift was profound. Instead of attributing violent outbursts or strange appearances to supernatural forces, doctors and scholars began to look for rational causes. Mental illness, disease, and even diet were considered as explanations. The concept of the werewolf as a creature cursed to roam the night was replaced by the understanding that these individuals might be suffering from real, treatable conditions. But while the werewolf trials came to an end, the legend of the werewolf didn't disappear entirely. In rural parts of Europe, particularly in isolated regions, the stories of werewolves continued to thrive. These areas were often far removed from the intellectual centers of the Enlightenment, where traditional beliefs held strong. In parts of France and Germany, the fear of the werewolf still lingered in folklore. Villagers told tales of strange creatures that roamed the forests at night, and these stories were passed down through generations. Even today, in some rural areas, the werewolf is still a figure of local legend. These beliefs are often tied to the landscape itself, where dense forests and dark nights make it easy to imagine that something wild is lurking just out of sight. In some regions, werewolf festivals and local traditions have kept these legends alive. In France, for example, certain villages host celebrations where the Lou Garou is a central figure. These festivals are a mix of history, folklore, and entertainment, bringing the ancient stories into the modern day. Similarly, in Germany, local traditions around the werewolf persist, especially in places where the forests still dominate the landscape. While these modern remnants of werewolf beliefs may not carry the same fear they once did, they show how deeply rooted the legend of the werewolf is in European culture. For centuries, the idea of the werewolf has fascinated and terrified, shaping local traditions and leaving a lasting mark on rural folklore. Even in today's world of science and technology, the shadow of the werewolf still lingers in the places where myth and reality meet. Whether you believe in werewolves or not, these myths continue to captivate us. The idea of humans turning into wolves has survived for thousands of years. I'd love to hear from you. Have you heard any local legends about werewolves? Do any stories from your own town or childhood keep the werewolf myth alive? Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. And if you enjoyed this journey through history, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm building a community where like-minded individuals can come together and discuss history. Thanks for watching. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the past. Good night.